Hi, this is your host, Laura Powers, and I'm so pleased to have Dr. Randall Bell on the show. He is an author of Me, We, Do, Be, and we're here to talk about disasters, and I think this is a, a very you know, relevant time <laughs> to be talking about this, and also economics, how that relates to disasters that come up and, and disasters of different scales and size. Thanks so much for being a guest on the show. Hey, Laura, it's great to be here. Thanks. So it's so funny because, yeah, what a crazy time. Like, this is literally something that we've never experienced in our lifetime. And in fact, there's nothing that's been really quite like this in any of our lifetimes or probably period. Uh, so I, I, I'm guessing you've been pretty busy <laughs> with your focus. <laughs> I've been busy in a weird way because, uh, you know, like you, I travel a lot and I, I do a lot of volunteer work in uh San Quentin prison and jails, wow. and I never thought I'd be in lockdown myself, but here we are in house arrest, and uh, but we, you know, life moves on. We got to figure it out. Yeah, yeah. So tell us a little bit about the work that you do. Uh, for example, your work uh, with with you know prisoners are in jail. That's fascinating. Well, um, I joined a group called Insight Prison Project. It's a secular program up in San Quentin. And uh, the long story short, I was on a plane and somebody sat down next to me. I hadn't seen him in 15 years. And, and he's on the board of directors. And he kind of said, hey, you want to go to prison? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> so far, I haven't been caught. So I've never been in one. And uh, so I went in and I was just, I was, ex I had all these stereotypes, Laura, of what it would be like in there. And when I got there, the, these guys were so docile and cool and respectful, and they had their act together. I was like a Buddhist monastery or something. It, it was bizarre. And uh, I was so intrigued. Now, I met the, the, the gentleman who had been in prison and been through this program for a year or two. So they had really kind of had the, uh, the benefit of processing everything and, and kind of gotten to that point. I just fell in love with the program. In fact, I've got a buddy who got, uh, he, he was, he's out on parole for uh, very, well, for murder. And uh, I just attended his graduation uh, from college and he graduated with honors. I, I didn't graduate from honors. I mean, uh, this program just does amazing things to turn lives around. So uh, that's, that's what I've been doing. Incredible. Yeah. I mean, for most of us, our only impression is what we see on, you know, media and television, Orange is the New Black or, you know, whatever TV show you might have seen where they're showing that. Yeah, it's interesting. My, my boyfriend is a forensic psychiatrist. And so I definitely, mm. you know, hear bits and pieces of just, just what it's like. Um, very interesting world. And I really feel like more of our focus should be on rehabilitation. It sounds like that program is really helping people instead of just a sort of more punitive approach, I guess. Exactly. The, the process is called restorative justice. And, and uh, you know, the stereotypes are actually true when they walk into prison. There's a lot, a lot of machoism and denial and anger and all that kind of, uh, you know, stuff. But this program, which is really based on two principles, uh, the recidivism rate, people that get out or are paroled, uh, almost never go back to prison. Their lives are genuinely turned around. Those, those two principles, one that we call grounding, we might call it outside of prison uh, meditation or uh, yoga or something else, but in, in prison we call it grounding. And the other one is just talking about, you know, what's really going on inside uh, right. instead of bottling things up. And those are the two, I call them the dynamic duo of kind of turning things around. Yeah, it is really interesting because I, I imagine when you're in prison, you do have a lot of time to think about things and kind of process and, and go within that you don't when you're just kind of living the daily grind, so to yeah. speak. And, and that is one of the things that's happening right now for a lot of people, not for everyone. Some people are manic. Let's say you're, you know, parent and you have young kids, and you're trying to work from home, like you don't have time. But for some people, suddenly they've been pulled out of their pattern. They don't have the activities that they're used to. And so in a way, it can feel kind of like a prison in the sense of like not being able to do things. Um, so let's, let's dive right into the topic of disasters and, uh, first of all, what got you to study disasters? Cause I think that's a really interesting subject. Well, I grew up in Southern California and, and uh, in the Orange County and I uh, did my grad work at UCLA in finance and accounting. And, and I really gravitated towards real estate and I started uh, doing all kinds of analytics and studies of real estate economics. And, and uh, at one point I thought, you know what, 
you know, and I actually applied to law school. I think I have adult ADD and I, I was just kind of bouncing around. I hadn't really landed on what I was cut out for in life. And, um, and the day before law school started, I thought, you know what, I just, I don't know that the world needs another lawyer. And if it does, it's, it's just not me. So I faxed, back in those days, we had these things called fax machines. I, I, <laughs> I remember those. <laughs> yeah, and I, I faxed in my resignation to law school. I thought, I'm going to take my whole skill set. And instead of looking at what creates value, I'm going to look at what causes a loss in value. Uh, and I was thinking in terms of landslides or, you know, things like that which are common in Southern California. And little did I know that there'd be this parade of disasters that I'd be working on, but that's what I've been doing ever since the 1980s. Okay, yeah, and just for the sake of your work, how do you define a disaster? Well, it, it, there's actually 10 categories, but it's things like environmental spills, uh, what we call geotechnical problems or soil problems with the soils, natural disasters, uh, construction defects, but they all break down into kind of 10 categories. Anything that causes, uh, in legal terms, in, in the courtroom is called a diminution, a diminution in value, a loss in value. Anything in that scope is what we work on. So in, in terms of, again, the, the legal terms and the kind of your perspective, how do you define what's happening now with uh, coronavirus and, and COVID? Well, believe it or not, as, as unique as COVID is, it's, it's what we call a class eight environmental contaminant. Uh, it's, it's what we call also further defined as an emerging contamination uh, or emerging contaminant. A virus, you know, they've been lots of viruses, there's been zillions of viruses over the decades, but this one uh, is unique uh, for obvious reasons and has caused a, a shutdown. So think about it, anything from a homeowner not paying their mortgage to the casinos in Las Vegas shutting down or uh, the office building owner, uh, wherever, um, it's affecting everybody in real estate. Yeah, I think for a lot of people, the biggest impact in their lives is the financial impact versus the, the medical, you know, kind of literally fear for your, your life in that way. So I think it's really fascinating because Yes, I do know people who have passed and who've gotten sick, but for most people, the biggest thing is loss of jobs. Like you said, loss of, you know, property, loss of income, you know, from lack, loss of lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And, and I met, I worked on the OJ Simpson case, you know, because of the crime scene stigma affecting the, uh, the condo. And I got mm -hmm. to go and know the family, the Brown family, and we're still friends to this day. Tanya yeah. Brown got COVID and, uh, you know, she had to stay home from work for, I think, three or four weeks. Uh, she told me it just really hammers you. But, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's, it's obviously very disruptive. Yeah, yeah. So in terms of studying it, so you, you understand the patterns. And I'm guessing there are certain kind of steps that happen along the way um, as things unfold. Can you talk a little bit about those? those steps, I mean, I imagine it's kind of like almost like processing a trauma in a way. Yeah, the, there's three stages of every disaster. It doesn't matter if we're talking about a, a landslide or a hurricane or earthquake or COVID. And the three stages are the assessment stage where you kind of figure things out, the repair stage where you build things back and remediate the, the, the problem. And then you have the, the ongoing stage, which we might call the kind of the new normal. I would say right now we're kind of in the still in the assessment stage. Frankly, I think we're still trying to figure things out with this whole yeah. COVID thing. And then we'll move into kind of a repair stage where we try and clean up the damage. And then, you know, everybody, there's already speculation what the new normal is going to look like, but it's always in those three stages. Yeah, I think it's really hard to know where we even are in a way because there's, it's, it's a, I guess that goes to your point that we're still in the assessment stage. It seems like a constant changing playing field. And also, I feel like it's very different depending on where you are. I mean, if you're in London versus you're in Queens, New York, or if you're in Montana or whatever, you know, your experience is very different with this. And therefore, your reaction is going to be uh, very different. So have you been called in by any groups to officially help with, you know, how do we handle this? Yes, I'm giving us a, a virtual speech to the Environmental Bankers Association. That's all the banks across the country to, you know, kind of a, a 
you know, sort this out. Real estate's different than the stock market because the, the stock market's like a speedboat. You know, you, you zip and yeah. it turns so and it's going up and yeah. down in a day. Real estate's not liquid. And so it takes, a, it's kind of like a, you know, a cruise liner where you turn the wheel and you don't even see the turn for a mile down. So um, we're, we're navigating, and, and there, but there's limited data and there's a lot of surveys kind of coming in. But I, as I say, we're still kind of in that assessment of the whole thing. And try, like anyone else, we're trying to figure this thing out. Yeah, it seems like, especially as you look at real estate, that we probably won't know for a while really how serious this is. But the stock market is higher than I honestly expected that it would be, given yeah. like everything that's happening, the, the amount of unemployment. And then when you look at real estate, you know, I monitor certain real estate lists and, you know, there's quite, there's some places that have gone down quite a bit already. Are you seeing certain sectors that are being hit more right now than others? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, it, the, a disaster is kind of like being, uh, you know, you hear the phrase, you know, we're all in the same boat. We're not in the we're same not. boat. We're, we're, <laughs> we're all in the same storm. But, right. you know, some of us are in a dinghy trying to pail out the water and some of us oh. are hanging on to some driftwood and some of us are in our yachts, you know, cruising through the storm. So like the casinos in Las Vegas, the, 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 the damage is profound because they're dark. They're completely vacant. But you go to Target and you would never know you're in a pandemic because, you know, they've been left open and they're, they're just doing uh, gangbusters. The grocery stores are immune from, from the problem, fast food. And then there's everything in between, you know, the dark to the, to the fully on board. And you got to look very specifically at what sector you're in. Yeah, yeah. And I think, like you said, we won't know for quite some time. The, the true impact of some of these things. So uh, you brought up a, a term, which I'd heard of environmental bankers. I, I love, I love the term. Can you tell us more about what that is? Environmental Bankers Association. These are a bunch of really smart men and women that basically, you know, it, 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 environmental contamination is relatively common throughout the country. A lot of people don't realize that, but think about like the service station has those big tanks underground. They can yeah. leak. And the leak can, it's called a plume. It can, you know, migrate underneath the street to the neighbors, that kind of thing. So these bankers will do loans on environmentally damaged real estate, but they're, it's, it's taking conventional mortgages to a whole new level because obviously you have to have environmental engineering backgrounds to kind of sort it all out and, and uh, you know, know what kind of risk you're getting into. But it's those kind of uh, people uh, over there. Yeah. <laughs> So I grew up not far from Rocky Flats. I don't know if you're familiar. Rocky Flats. Very. I've been there twice. I've been. Okay. Twice. Yeah. And I just feel like, you know what, though, it's fascinating. Most people have no idea. They just like, there's all this housing development going on around there. And I'm like, I wouldn't want a house like right here. <laughs> That's my personal opinion. <laughs> I just think that would not be a choice I would make <laughs> <laughs> to be near Rocky Flats. Uh, so have you, what brought you there? You said you were doing some work there. Yeah, a buddy of mine, Wayne Hunsberger, he actually did the work for going into the courtroom, and I did a little bit of the work uh, involved with it as well. And uh, Rocky Flats, just for people that don't know, is in uh, beautiful Colorado. You you go beautiful there, area. It's yeah, it's totally gorgeous. gorgeous. But you know, I've also been to Chernobyl, and I've been to the Bikini Atoll where they did nuclear weapons test sites. Those are all gorgeous areas too. Chernobyl is really a very pretty area. Um, but it's, it's been uh, contaminated with radioactive uh, problems because I think in Rocky Flats, if my memory is right, they were manufacturing nuclear weapons there or something, and there was a release of yeah. radiation throughout the, the, the area, the region. And so um, I use Rocky Flats, not only was I involved in it, but I, but I also use it as what we call a case study. So when I work on other radioactive sites, right now we're working on two or three around the country, uh, we we kind of have an idea of what's going to happen in terms of the economics based upon those case studies. Yeah, it's fascinating. I'm I'm very sensitive to energy as you know an empath, and I swear when I drive by, even not super close to Rocky Flats, I will feel it. Like it feels very heavy to me. Did you feel? Have you in all these places? Have you have you felt a difference? I'm curious. Uh, you're you're better than me because I go to these places. You know, I go to crime scenes where other people say they've seen ghosts. I've never seen a ghost. Yeah. I've been to several radioactive sites. I don't. I, I guess that part is missing. <laughs> I, I kind of I think about it more in terms of uh, 
the, the economics and the numbers, but I've met people that have just said, like you say, they, they feel yeah. something. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you're working in it, it's probably better. You don't feel it. <laughs> yeah. You can just focus on, on what you're doing. So yeah. in terms of like sort of practical application for people, you know, how can we kind of ride through this disaster? You know, if you look at it that way, yeah, you know, well, be, you know, to ride it as smoothly as possible, you know, whatever kind of dinghy or boat or whatever we're in and, and yeah. then do well on the other side. Yeah, that's a fair question. The, the, I, I've been fascinated by that question. I started kind of started, I started my career, you know, in, in finance and accounting and all that kind of thing. But then as I met the people behind the statistics, I was so fascinated by you know, what I would call they either take a dive, they, they survive or they thrive. It's those three categories. I thought, what is it about a person that thrives in the aftermath of a disaster that separates them from those that survive or just, you know, take a dive? And I'm not trying to be judgmental. I mean, if right. I haven't been through their problem, I might, you know, dive or just survive myself. But I really focus on the thrivers and I notice patterns. Um, that kind of come into it. And, and that's, I mean, I'm going to use my book as a <laughs> visual aid, but the me is our kind of our mindset kind of, that's where it starts is our mindset. And then we is our relationships with others, how, how we get along with other people and how that works. Do is, you know, our level of productivity, keeping a routine like right now is especially important yeah. with the coronavirus. And then B is what we're becoming kind of having that vision and that focus you know, on the future, what we, what we want to do. So I kind of broke it all down into these four categories to try and sort out what, what it is about some people that, that uh, you know, thrive versus don't. I think that's a, it's a really fascinating thing and, and really important right now. And I also, I feel like it's important to address that you may be, you know, in a dive or a survive place right now, but that doesn't mean that might not lead you to thrive later. Like I you know, in the, like in the moment, like for me, uh, during the recession, that was my sort of disaster, um, that kind of changed my life where I was, you know, in a marriage that ended, uh, the economy tanked all the work in my sector. I was in, um, I was in higher education, uh, you know, I was in fundraising, I was in uh, government, like it just, everything was so hard hit. There were no jobs Mm -hmm. And my health was bad. It was just like, you know, everything kind of like was in a bad place. And at the time I was just, I feel like just kind of surviving, maybe diving in the beginning and then surviving. But then afterwards I really thrived. And I think if I hadn't gone through that, I would actually be in a worse place now than I was, you know, if I hadn't. So. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. I mean, the stats are that 66 to 85% of everyone by college age has been through a trauma. And there, and there's usually not limited to just one. They keep coming throughout life. By the time you get my age, it's pretty much a hundred percent. You've been through some kind of trauma, but they really have the potential of, uh, you know, allowing growth. I mean, you either grow or you die. Those are your really your two options. And uh, you know, just like your trauma kind of knocks you down, just like mine have. Um, there's certain things you can do to really increase your odds dramatically towards really kind of getting into that thriving fulfillment mode. Okay, great. Well, let's definitely talk about that. Cause I think even if you're in a good place, you can always, you know, be better. So, uh, yeah. and also be in a place where we can help others, you know, process yeah. whatever's happening with them as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the, yeah, again, we break it down into the me, we do be, and it starts with the mindset. I mean, simple as this sounds, it, all the principles are remarkably simple, but they're not necessarily easy, but, but, uh, you know, getting them intellectually. And, and by the way, what I did, you know, in writing this book is I surveyed 5,000 people uh, in the United States and Canada, the UK and Australia. And what we did is we statistically correlated various daily habits with various results. And uh, so it's, this is not anecdotal stuff. I mean, um, I have a team of uh, researchers and, and that's what we do is we, we dive into the academic literature and research and it, it does start in the mindset. And so simply making up your mind, hey, I am not gonna get beaten up and destroyed by this thing, that, that conscientious decision itself is very, very dramatic. 
uh, because the people that er, everybody takes a dive when I went through trauma, you know, everybody takes a dive. There's nothing to be ashamed of. The, the question is, am I going to stay there or am I going to grow and move on? So as simple as it sounds, the first step is saying, hey, I'm going to do something about this. Kind of just determining, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it through this. I'm, <laughs> so I guess in a way, it's a, that positive thinking, but also there's a determination element to it. Yeah, and just a decision that I, hey, I'm knocked down. I'm gonna get back up. Uh, I'm not gonna lay here. Um, that that decision again, very simple but very powerful. So. One of the things that helped me when everything was unfolding is I felt at the time very much like in a victim mindset. And I actually went to a, a counselor who was uh, helping me and my, my husband at the time. And he said to me, Laura, you know, you have to honor your intuition that like there was, you know, that you had a piece to play in this, even if all the signs were showing like everything's fine, like there was something you have to honor your piece. And I think that was very helpful for me. It was hard at first because it, in a way, there's kind of comfort to feeling like a victim and just laying on the ground like I'm helpless, like here I am. <laughs> yeah. But in the long term, it's actually very weak and it's, it's kind of like hard to pull yourself up out of it. But, but I, that personally helped me. And I, I have a feeling that probably a lot of people that are able to do that kind of get back up. They kind of like are like, no, I'm not going to be a victim. I'm going to kind of stand up. Yeah, yeah, well said. I mean, the, the, the first step of a trauma is shock. I mean, I can't yeah, believe my marriage sure. is coming to an end. I can't believe we're sitting here on house arrest with the coronavirus. I mean, there's a shock to it. And then there's a denial. Like, you know, no one's going to tell me I can't go out of my house or no one's going to tell me this or that. Um, and, and so there's shock and then there's denial. And then that goes into anger and anger can, you know, is something that, that we all go through. And I tell people, if you're if you're angry, be angry, but don't don't hurt yourself and don't hurt others. But anger is completely normal. And these are normal processes that you just kind of have to work through and get out of your system. Um, but again, you don't want to be stuck there. Yeah, well, I think anger is an improvement from feeling like a victim or apathy, or whatever, because at least there's energy behind it. There's some kind of like forward movement in a way. It's funny, I've seen this a lot on, for example, social media with people where they're just being so easily triggered with anger about anything, you know, dif mm. different disagreement about masks or, you know, you name whatever that has it relate to this coronavirus, people are being very triggered. And I've just realized, oh my gosh, this isn't, in a lot of ways, this isn't even about that issue. It's just these people are just, they have this anger, they just are looking for an outlet to express this emotion that is their processing right now. So if you're having this where someone's being really angry at you, <laughs> I think maybe you just take a pause and be like, wait, I don't even know if this is about me. This may just be, do you think that's fair to say? I think it's very, very fair to say. I mean, anger can, uh, here's the problem with anger. And, and if you watch too much news, you can literally get addicted to anger. Totally. Uh, anger, you know, it, it secretes, I mean, I can, you know, the physiology of what the chemicals are being secreted from our brains, but they're very, very chemical, uh, they're very, very powerful chemicals. And you got to be careful. I mean, again, you want to acknowledge that I have every right to be angry. I am angry. But at the same time, you want to think, I don't want to stay here because uh, sadly, just as you pointed out, there's a lot of people and they come out on social media and they're, they're annoying to all of us. Uh, and I've had to leave certain Facebook groups for example, because, you know, it's just people are stuck there and it's kind of like, hey, I, I'm angry too, but I'm going to move on. Um, and, and you have to make that decision. After anger comes kind of the bargaining where you kind of try and negotiate. And then the next kind of hurdle is depression. I mean, depression is kind of a cousin to anger. But again, that's kind of in the dive stage. That's where a lot of people kind of get permanently stuck in depression. Mm, uh, yeah. Two things about depression. One is the chemicals. You know, sometimes you just need to surrender and go see a professional and, and, and have medications. And that's totally fine. Um, nothing, nothing wrong with that. Uh, just like a physical ailment, you go to someone and you get the help you need. But the other part of a depression is something you can very much do something about in terms of looking at your attitude. Are you exercising? Because exercise is statistically, factually, medically, scientifically proven to either eliminate depression or at least reduce the doses of medication that you've got to be on. 
So that's something your body can naturally uh, do to help heal. Yeah, I think this is so, so important, especially right now where maybe people's even access to being outside is, you know, limited, that there are things you can do. I thankfully a couple of years ago bought a recumbent bike. Um, mm. And I am so glad that is like, I'm like so glad that I got that a couple of years ago because it's been my sort of godsend. And whenever I feel kind of down, I'll just go up there and, you know, what I do is it's a recumbent bike so I can easily read. So I'll just like read for like 30 minutes, an hour. And then I'm like helping my mind shift by focusing on something positive. And then I'm also getting that blood going. And, you know, a lot of people don't realize that exercise releases so many positive endorphins. And, and we tend to think that whatever's happening in our mind is kind of circumstantial based on whatever our circumstances. But I feel like so much of it is biochemical. It's literally just like biochemical things happening in the brain. If you shift the chemicals, then you shift your mindset, period. Exactly. You, you hit the nail on the head, Laura, because there is a very definite connection between the mind and the heart and the muscles. It's all a system and you can't do something that damages one part of that system and it, it ripples out to the other parts of the entire system. So exercise uh, does secrete the endorphins um, and you, you, there's, a, <laughs> there's real physiology to the runner's high. I mean, one of the things that I'm kind of you know, frankly, down with, with the whole coronavirus is I was a, I was a runner. I ran three, five, 10 miles a day. Um, but I had to go on to this uh, dermatology thing where I had to stay out of the sun. So mm -hmm. not only am I dealing with the coronavirus, I'm dealing with the fact I'm not doing my regular exercise. And right. I'll just be honest, you know, it gets you down. It gets you kind of blue. Yeah. I can't wait for this to kind of you know, heal up and get back in the sun and start exercising because I really miss it because it's, it's not just great physically. It's impossible to improve yourself physically without improving yourself spiritually, emotionally, and, and every other way. Absolutely. Like when you do exercise, it gets your blood going, it helps your brain, it helps your chakras. If you are into that, it's, it's all encompassing. So yeah. And what mm -hmm. you're talking about too, is that fresh air. I mean, I think nature is so important. So again, that's tough. Not everyone can have that right now, but if you can even a little bit getting outside into the sun, get your vitamin D, get your fresh air. <laughs> yeah. That also will really help. It's so funny because so where I'm locked down is, is um, golden area and you can literally walk outside of my house and go hiking and you know, there's parks and things around. And it's just so fascinating because you'd watch the news and it's literally like the sky is falling down. Everything's horrible. This is a crisis. This is the worst thing of our lifetimes, of our parents' lives. It's just like bad, 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 bad. And then I'd walk outside and like the rabbits are hopping around and, you know, everything's blooming and the birds are singing and there's squirrel. And it's like, oh yeah, it, it just perks up your mind. You're just suddenly you're like, oh wait, we're okay. Things are okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we are going to survive this thing. Uh, this yeah. is not the end of the world. You know, the day the coronavirus really broke, uh, I was doing a TV interview uh, in Hollywood, and I did one that was uh, on Zoom with New York, a New York station. And, I, and some people were looking at me like it was nuts. And, you know, during the commercial breaks in the newsroom, people were freaking out. I mean, normally they're reporting helicopter crashes or something, but during the commercial breaks, you know, it's just, you know, time to chat. Everyone was freaking out. And there I am, you know, saying on TV, hey, this is not the end of the world. We're going to get through it. And I maintain that. We, we will sure. get through this. Uh, and, and like you said, getting out into nature, reminding ourselves of that is really a pretty great idea. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, boy, it can literally feel like your world is falling apart. And maybe in some ways it is because everything that was your life may be shifting or has shifted as a result of this. But I'm curious about your studying people that have survived this. Um, if once you've gone through one thing, are you then more resilient? Because I feel like because I went through what I did during the recession, I just, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to be okay. Like, yeah, that sucked. <laughs> I mean, as an experience, it was really painful and difficult, but I'm good now. And I know that I can just, whatever kind of gets taken away, I could rebuild it again. I already did it. I can do it again. Do you find that is the case with people as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we kind of talked about the five different stages in the in the dive stage, and then you get into survival. The first thing, and I, we've already kind of alluded to it, is kind of confront the situation. In prison, we call it sit in the fire, meaning you, the, the, the biggest problem you can have in coronavirus or any disaster in life, any crisis or trauma in life, is to bottle it up inside. I mean, um, the way it was described to me when I first went into the San Quentin prison system 
was that you know a lot of these inmates had horrible childhoods and they would fill it, they would bottle it up and bottle it up and then they were triggered one guy said somebody laughed at me and he responded by literally killing them um wow. because there was so much pressure because his family didn't have enough money he was bullied at school and he had this very macho exterior uh veneer but underneath he was hurting and he responded in obviously a very very horrible way that he sits in prison and regrets every day you don't want to make that mistake and he's the one that told me this don't bottle it up inside if you're feeling stressed about coronavirus or anything else find a trusted person and talk about it uh, whether that person can fix it or not that's not even the point the fact that you're not bottling up the emotions is very very healing absolutely and i think exactly what you talked about with this person who unfortunately you know exploded and had a severely negative detriment yeah. to themselves and others. And this happens, I think, you know, obviously on not, not such a mass scale, but it can literally damage our health. I feel like a lot of times when people do this, it literally will manifest in, you know, heart problems and, you know, high blood pressure and things like that. Like it needs to be released. And Yes, find someone. But you know, another thing is if you don't have access to a person is journaling, just finding some way where you can somehow share or process whatever it is that you're feeling and honor it and, and know that they're, it, it's valid. Like if you're feeling it, there's validity to it. Yeah, that, perfectly said, because a lot of people say, well, I don't have a trusted person and, and I can't afford a therapist. And I say, okay, I get it. And you hit the nail on the head, journal. You can always find a piece of paper and write down your feelings. And if you're afraid someone's going to find it, you can then, you know, shred it or throw it away or whatever. Sure. But you got to express what you're feeling inside because um, th there's no there's no successful path <laughs> uh, to, to keeping it bottled up. It's got to come out in either productive ways or, or destructive ways. And um, I think it's better to go with the productive uh, route. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that. I'm curious in your studies if you've uh, addressed or looked at the relationship between addiction and disasters and trauma, because I, I think that's what's happening for a lot of people right now. They're like, oh, I don't have an outlet. They're frustrated. They don't frustrated. They, you know, they end up drinking a lot or, you know, doing something else. Um, could be shopping. Everyone has, you know, different addictions, some yeah. more, you know, dangerous than others. But is that something that you've looked at? Yeah, absolutely. You know, actually, before I started uh, with my work in San Quentin prison, I was uh, volunteering for years at the homeless shelter in Laguna Beach, where I have, have a, a home. And, um, and addiction is usually, not always, but usually associated with homelessness. And, it, it, you know, every Sunday, I would go and sit in down with a room full of uh, homeless folks. And, um, and addiction was a, a really, really big thing. Addiction, of course, is not the problem. There's a problem that they're trying to mask. Oftentimes, right. it's a childhood uh, abusive situation or sexual abuse uh, or something, and and the the emotions are so negative and so dark that they're trying to use the alcohol or you know jacking up on heroin or whatever their uh, poison is uh, to mask those feelings. So yeah, you can detox people all day long, but you really got to get at that, you know, issue going back and, and sit in the fire and talk about what it is you're trying to mask. What is so painful uh, that you can't deal with it? And, um, and that's how, that's the big picture with addiction. I think it's so important to bring that up because I feel like as our society, we really treat the addiction as the problem, but this is exactly why, unless you deal with the underlying cause trigger that it'll just keep manifesting. And again, this doesn't mean that you're an alcoholic or a drug addict. It could be, you know, you're addicted to uh, the news. Like, you know, it's that, that kind yep. of, you're addicted to shopping, you're addicted to sex. I mean, there are all kinds of different addictions that we might not think of as necessarily super destructive, but they damage our ability, I think, to move forward in a healthy way and to be vital and, you know, live our, our best life. So any tips or suggestions you have for people if they find themselves really struggling with just falling into some kind of coping pattern like that? 
Yeah, the, 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 the news about addiction is really pretty good news, and that is that social science and psychology and psychiatry and uh, the medical sciences are, have gotten so advanced that if you, and there is really good competent help out there. The, the problem with a lot of these recovery centers, and uh, you know, I write about it openly in my book, is that they detox the physical addiction to alcohol or to drugs or whatever it is. And there's, a, like you said correctly, there's a whole spectrum of addictions, right. but they're not treating the core underlying problem, number one, and number two, uh, addiction, if you think about it, is a very selfish mindset. It's like, you know, I'm feeling this, I'm feeling that, I need to do this, I need to self-medicate with that. And, and it's, you're, it's me, me, me. You know, I'm all for me, we, do, be, but uh, addicts get stuck here on the me, and they don't think about um, the whole spectrum of life. And the component that they're missing, and why Alcoholics Anonymous, which is old school, but it really works, is they get you into a, a, a service mindset. Find somebody less fortunate than yourself and be of service to them. Uh, that That is gold when it comes to an authentic recovery is to first get yourself healthy, which you've got to do, and then take it to the next step and help others who are dealing with problems. Then you've got a complete recovery, not just uh, one that's uh, you know, where you fall off the bandwagon, uh, you know, mm, sadly, you right. know, six months later. Yeah, there's a, a little a phrase or expression I learned when I was, I was taking a training course, and I thought it was so powerful. It's really simple. And it was simply this sort of mantra, which is, when you get nervous, focus on service. <laughs> you know, and it's just like, whenever you're, whatever you're focusing on, your, whatever your, your problems are, you know, if you just kind of, kind of pull that ego aspect out of it and look on the big picture and what you can do to, to, to serve and help. It's amazing how it can just really shift things very dramatically. At least it did for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that quote. I'm going to, I may be using that. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I, I, Won't you? <laughs> do. I've, I've shared it with several people and I've, it's amazing how profound it's like this kind of shift where you're just like, Oh wait, I don't need to be just in this me place. And then it kind of gets you to focus on that perspective and wherever you are in this, you know, whatever kind of boat you're in during this storm that we're all in, you know, there is someone that you can help and you certainly are better than, than some people. And, you know, if you're listening to this podcast, it's likely that you're still top 1% of the world. So just keep that in mind. <laughs> in terms of whatever has been taken away, even when I was at like my lowest, you know, during, uh, after the recession had started, like I still, you know, I had a house, I had a place to live. It wasn't my house anymore because I lost that, but I, I had a place to live. I had food. I had, you know, people that were, you know, caring about me. And it's just always important to remember those things, how lucky we still are, I think, in the bigger picture of the world as well. Yeah, absolutely. You know, having a sense of gratitude. I mean, we kind of, you know, that point alone takes us from the survival mode to the thrive mode. And a, a big component, a big hallmark of thrivers is that they have a service mindset and they definitely have gra a gratitude mindset. I mean, you know, I'm thinking about it, you know, when this whole coronavirus thing came down, I thought, you know what, I, I got to kind of, A, I got to kind of practice what I preach, but let's face it, I'm, you know, it, it hits me like it hits anyone else. And I, I got, oh, here it is. Um, I, I actually started a list and I started keeping track of my accomplishments. And, uh, and, and I'm shocked. At, now, these aren't necessarily huge things. It's not like I'm, you know, building bridges or anything, but um but these are little things that I'm doing to kind of improve my life. And I've, I've uh, gotten healthier with my eating. Um, you, know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm doing all kinds of things. So to get into the thrive mode, you've got to kind of look at, hey, this really is no fun, but it is what it is. What can I do to be productive and what can I do to grow from it? And before you know it, you've got a long list if you have that mindset. Yeah, I think, you know, too, everyone processes through trauma and things differently. You know, there's that um, fight, flight, freeze, and I've heard recently they added fawn, which I thought is actually really important. So let's, this is why, you know, the fawn thing is maybe someone who's actually attacked you might actually almost like what you might consider like kiss up to them or, you know, because you just, that's just a, a way to process or try to handle something traumatic. And I think a lot of people right now are in freeze mode and they don't even realize, like they just literally just, feels like they can't do anything. 
And I was reading a book on procrastination and one of the tips in there that I thought was really great was it was like, just break it down into the smallest step, like write it down. Uh, you know what I need to do, put, um, dishes in the dishwasher you know, and then cross it. Literally it sounds like it's such a simple thing, but sometimes we need to do whatever we can to break out of whatever phase we're in. So if you're in that freeze mode where you just feel like unmotivated, you feel like you can't do anything, just break it down into something so simple and then do that thing. And then just like, like you said, pat yourself on the, I did that, you know, uh, maybe it's brushing your teeth that day. Maybe it's something bigger, going for a run or reading a book, you know, but wherever you are, go where you are and then take those steps to help yourself. Uh, beautifully said. I mean, when you experience a trauma and COVID is traumatic, let's face it. Yeah. You, you, with any trauma, you have three options, fight, and fortunately, I don't, you know, I mean, some people, you know, there's reports of domestic violence going up and that, that's yeah. very, very sad and not cool at all. Um, but, uh, you know, fortunately, I'm very, um, I think we should all be proud of our country. There's no riots going on and, and people are, you know, essentially uh, being cool about it. The other one is to uh, flight, run away, but where are you going to run to? Because there's things everywhere. Yeah. And the third option is freeze. And I think you hit the nail on the head. That's really where most people are stuck is in this freeze mode and to unfreeze, you kind of have to, I would use the word experiment. You got to try different things, but in, in experimenting, what's going to work for you and what's right for, for you. And I think, you know, we've generated a lot of, you know, good ideas, but ultimately where someone lands is what they kind of try out. But one thing that's essential and that is to maintain a routine, you know, set the alarm clock in the morning. So you get up, have a routine. If it, and ideally it includes some exercise, um, and, and then pick a daily routine that makes sense for you. So the days don't just kind of run one into another, do something special on the weekends, just like you normally would. These are all little things we can do, uh, in terms of kind of habits to, to kind of keep our uh, emotions elevated and, uh, you know, get through this thing. Yeah. I, I think honestly, for me, the hardest time was when you're the old system has just been cleared away and you're trying to figure out, okay, what is my new routine? What is this going to be like? How long is this going to be? And once I kind of figured that out, it was so much easier. I, I created my own routine. So I, you know, start the day and I jump right into podcast recordings, you know, interviews where I'm interviewed, client meetings, teaching a class or something. I have my sort of work day. And then I'm like, okay, I'm going to cook dinner. I'm going to ride my exercise bike and read. <laughs> I'm going to do some gratitude exercises. And it, it really, it's amazing. It helps your brain because then you can focus on like the task at hand. Like I feel like our brains need, they need something to, it needs something to work on. And once you, you can determine what that is, and then your brain stops trying to work so hard <laughs> on all yeah. these things that it can't solve anyway. Like how long is this going to go on or what does this mean for me? And you know, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. I, I love your list. It's a great list. I would just add one more thing to it. And yeah. that's to give, you know, kind of cut yourself a little slack. I mean, oh, yeah. and, you know, you know what I mean? Because, you know, the, the, the problem, one of the problems of this book, you know, I'm beyond, I wrote the thing, but the, one of the problems is it's got like, um, close to 50 different daily habits. Like if you make your bed and put your mind into a productive mindset for the rest of the day, and that's scientifically proven. But if you, if you try and adopt, uh, adapt 50 new habits, you're going to go insane. I mean, I would go insane and I wrote the thing. You, you, <laughs> the idea is to look at the menu of new habits or techniques and pick one or two that um, really resonate with you and just do that. But d don't, uh, I would just caution people to not keep it on too thick because then you're yeah. setting yourself up for failure. We don't, we don't want to do that in the home. I got to just tell you real quickly in the homeless shelter, I was kind of talking about life skills with the homeless men and women there, you know, you know, goal setting and time management, all these things. And, you know, this one guy came in, he, he'd come week after week and he came in and one day he was just charged up. He goes, Oh, I'm going to do 50 pushups a day. I'm going to go to the library and read. I'm going to go to the beach and meditate. And boom, boom, boom. And I said, Oh, okay. That's all great. Yeah, but yeah. you know, pick one, pick one. And he says, well, I'm going to do 50 pushups a day. And I go, okay, Danny, his name is Danny. I said, Danny, just do one push up a day. And then you can do 49 more if you want to. And he goes, uh, and he's like, okay. And I said, that's your commitment. Next week he goes, I didn't do 50, but I did 10. And I said, that's awesome. You did 10 times more than your commitment. 
That's huge. And the next week he was doing more and no more and more. One day I went in the homeless shelter. I saw Danny. He was really upset. I said, what's, what's up, Danny? What's, what's the matter? He goes, I got a job. I've reconnected with my kids. I am sad because I'm going to miss you. I'm going to miss the classes we Aww. have. And, and um, that one push up a day rippled out into changing his life. So I really caution people to be kind to yourself yeah. and, and don't, don't heap it on too thick. No, I think that's really good because we are going through a lot and have gone through a lot of trauma and we need to be gentle with ourselves. And when I was making my list, I should add that I also have Netflix on there. Like every night I've been watching that, which is this kind of fun escape. And then my little kind of during the day, if I need a little mental break is I, I play words with friends, you know, it's the phone scrabble game. And I feel like that's great because it, it is using your mind, you're kind of problem solving, but it's, it's fun. It's a fun little diversion. So you'll find those things with you. And I think the point you brought up about not aiming too high at first for your, especially daily goals is really important because if you do that, then you're just going to get into this negative cycle of, oh, I didn't do that, getting negative on yourself, kind of just not doing anything. So yeah, that's why I was saying like, literally, if it's maybe you have dishes in the sink, put dishes in the dishwasher, you know, like literally wh wherever you are uh, and then build up. And there's all kinds of studies that show that people that, you know, they, you know, totally transformed their life. The first thing they did was they just reduced the number of cigarettes they were smoking that day or whatever. And like gradually over time, it just helped you shift. So this has been so fun. Uh, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. I'd just love to see, is there anything else you'd like to share that you think would be helpful that we haven't talked about? I, I think it's been a terrific conversation. Thanks again for having me. I, I would just say that, um, kind of reframe, this is a time to kind of reframe. I'm reframing, you know, uh, you know, setting new goals, um, kind of, uh, you know, a newfound spirit. I, you know, when coronavirus is over, I think I've got some new cool things I'm going to tackle. Um, I talked to one um, survivor, their home was actually cracked in half by a landslide. And wow. I was having dinner with them in Hollywood a couple weeks ago. And I asked Peter, uh, my, my new friend, uh, you know, how was that, you know, losing your home is a luxury home come day home one day it was cracked in half. He says the best thing that ever happened to me. I said, What do you mean? He says, Well, we were living comfortably luxurious lives. We had these dreams, but we were so comfortable in where we were. And the landslide forced us to move out of that house. It was now uninhabitable. And um, now and then he went on to describe this dream that he had created with his wife. Um, where he outfits Western movies, 40 or 50 Western movies, because he's got all the saddles and the guns and the and um, clothing to outfit Western movies, which was his dream job. Aww. But living comfortably prevented him from doing that. The point of this is to say, hey, um, let's look back on this coronavirus and say, that was the best thing that ever happened to me because it really broke me out of my comfort zone and woke me up and use the fuel, let's face it, the stress is fuel, use the fuel to propel us to something, to do something really super cool. That's really the pinnacle of where we wanna go. I'm so with you because I feel like that's what happened to me during the recession where it, from the, from the initial level, it's just like, this is, this is literally a disaster in my life. Like everything in my life, my, you know, I lost my home, my marriage, my livelihood, mm. my money, my health. <laughs> you know, my mental state was terrible. <laughs> it's like, I mean, there literally wasn't anything that, that at that time felt like it was going well in my life. But at the same time, it got made me do this major pivot, this like realignment. And then everything that I created after that was so much better than anything that I could have imagined. I mean, yes, we're kind of on pause right now and having another sort of reassessment realignment with coronavirus. But, you know, I travel all the time. I go wherever I want to go. I work with celebrities. I do television. I, you know, I'm creative. I, you know, I'm fit. I have time to sleep. I sleep in because I don't like to get up early. Like, you know, all these things that were not in my life at that time. And if I had just kept going down that track of where I was at that point in my life, I wouldn't be where I'm now. So I think we all have those. And it's just a matter of, you know, patience, being kind to ourselves, and then just letting things play out. Because some of these things, it's like, yeah, it's not going to be tomorrow that you see the benefits. And maybe even in a few years, or maybe even longer. But I promise that there will be things like that for you, if you if you can be patient with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was perfectly said. And these little tiny daily habits, and these little shifts of mindset, 
it's like interest. You know, you're just saving a few dollars a, a month, but before you know it, you, you got, you know, a big bank account. It's the same thing in the emotional or spiritual or, or um, intellectual department, just reading a page a book. I mean, I wrote this book a page at a time. Uh, I wasn't the brightest guy in the classroom, but I could write one page a day. And before you know it, by the end of the year, you got a book. Um, so you, I think you nailed it uh, with, the, with the kind of let's have the mindset, turn it around and, and look back on this whole coronavirus and say, hey, uh, that was the best thing that ever happened because I used that fuel, I used that time to do something I never would have done had I been stuck in my comfortable life before. Mm. So great. Well, thank you. This has been such a pleasure to talk with you. If people want to learn more about you, what you do, you know, get your book, et cetera, what is the best way for them to do all of those things? Hey, I'm accessible and I love talking to people. Uh, I've got a website, coreiq.com, and it's a nonprofit. Um, we, there's, it's, everything's free. There's all these life skills, uh, whether it's time management, goal setting. You mentioned chakras. We got an episode on that. Uh, meditation. Uh, sitting in the fire, all the things we've been talking about. You can watch videos. There's not even a place to put in your credit card number if you wanted to. It's just not how it operates. Uh, but it's uh, just go to Core IQ and uh, you know get the free education uh, or uh, training videos and uh, reach out to me uh, uh, through Core IQ. Amazing. Well, it's such a pleasure. It's so funny. We were scheduled to talk a couple of weeks ago. And I feel like today was just the right time <laughs> for us to talk. So yeah. <laughs> all in divine timing. Thank you so much for talking with us today. It's been really my pleasure. Oh, thanks, Laura. It's been absolutely terrific. And thank you, everybody, for listening. If you'd like more information about me on the sort of psychic spiritual side, you can go to healingpowers.net. And then on the more business side, you can go to powershour.biz. You can find me on Twitter at that Laura Powers, Instagram at Laura Powers 44, and on Facebook at Healing Powers. Thanks for listening.